celebrating and showcasing extraordinary people who are doing incredible things to make our world a better place. This is Close Up Television. I'm your host, Jim Masters, and thanks for joining us. On today's episode, we celebrate Gail Faulkner. Gail is a renowned artist who's been painting for more than 35 years. She specializes in showcasing the best of contemporary textural acrylic art. The type of paintings that she does is known as textural impressionism. And what is most unique about her work is that she mostly uses a palette knife as opposed to a paintbrush. Gail says textural painting is acrylic paint when you add things like acrylic modeling paste and acrylic gel. They thicken the paint and they allow for it to be more textural so it has that 3D-ish effect. You can actually see the depth within the painting. There are many layers in any given area as well. Oppressionism is defined by Gail in the following way. When an artist is immersed in the creative process, their connection to the subject comes through. There's a lot of expressive interpretation rather than a precise description of the subject. The impressionist artist lets their passion create in the moment application of paint with light and shadow as well as layers of color. Now as a keen observer of nature, Gail relies on her memory and her mind's eye as she paints and therefore allows the painting to become a happening. Even though the elements and principles of design and composition are important aspects, they become intuitive so that the artist can live in their painting and record every emotion to capture their impression of nature's beauty. Gail paints primarily landscapes, although she enjoys painting animals, birds, and florals as well. She enjoys all her paintings equally and doesn't have one specific work that she calls her favorite. But what people like most about her artwork is that they feel like they can actually walk into her paintings. Gail joins me in the close-up television studio for an exclusive interview, also to show us some of her extraordinary paintings. Gail, it's so wonderful to have you here at our close-up television studios. We had you as a guest on close-up radio, had a fascinating conversation, but what you do is so visual, so we needed to have you come here so we can see some of the paintings up close and personal, and also dive deeper into the passion you have and love you have for art. So, welcome. Thank you. I'm really glad to be here. You know, I like to dig a little deep sometimes to find out what really makes our guests tick, what mm -hmm. motivates them, what inspires them for you. What initially inspired you to want to go into the world of art and specifically painting? As a small child, I remember sitting in my grandma's pantry just off the kitchen. There was a little table and chair set that my sister and I used. And I used to draw the same flower over and over and over. And I just loved that whole process. And I very vividly remember the day that I said, I want to be an artist. If I can do anything in this world is to be an artist. Well, life, you know, moves on and you've got a lot of other things that you're doing and being in school, we did not have that opportunity to have art really anywhere um, present, but I, we had an art teacher when I was in high school, no, in grade school, I'm sorry, an art teacher in grade school that would travel around the whole district, the Kansas City, Missouri School District, and we would see her for one half hour per month, which was not very much, and we used the stereotypical watercolor paints that every school child has and we had basically typing paper that we painted on. Not a great combination, but the thing that stuck with me the most, she'd always say, well when you finish your painting, just use the dirty water to do your sky. Mm. And this struck such a chord of, oh my gosh, how horrible. The dirty water. Yeah, yeah, dirty water. But So that's what really stuck to me the most. But art wasn't something that really, again, that I was able to pursue. Um, when I was in high school, we did have an art teacher. He had just graduated from college. He was wonderful and kind of a, one of the great ironies is that years later when I was doing art festivals, he was one of the artists that also did the art festivals. And he was a wonderful artist that did things with a brayer. So I wish I'd taken the opportunity to have classes with him, but I knew I, would, I needed a scholarship to go to college. So I thought, no, I think I'll take music classes instead mm. of art classes because I was afraid I'd get a really bad grade in art. So I remember music class very vividly also. I guess I have a really vivid imagination and memory. But I remember mostly standing at the piano with the um, music teacher, and each of us had to sing. And the whole point of having us do that was so that we could sing on key. Mm. But that was not part of my ability. She always had me stand at the very back of the room when we did a choir presentation or something like that. So I got in Mercy A so we can show that hard work and determination 
can get you where you need to be. So that was a good kind of lesson for life. And then as I went on, you know, I got my scholarship to a really great college, and they had an art department, but again, I was kind of on a path, I have a degree in sociology, and I really love that aspect of humanity, how people live and how they find a life for themselves. So that's the direction I decided to pursue. And then my very last semester, I needed about 10 credits to graduate, but I had to have 16 credits to um, keep my scholarship. Right. So I decided, you know what? I think I'll just take a couple of art classes. At that point, I didn't care about the GPA. I didn't care about anything. So one of the classes I took was a drawing class. And I remember we had what I thought were enormous 18 by 24 pads of newsprint. And we had a live model. And um, the whole semester, he would walk past my paintings, and he would just say, bigger. So they started about this big. They got a little bigger, got a little bigger. I was really working hard to get them bigger. And we were using soft pastels, which are kind of like chalk. And then so towards the end of the semester, as college students, we don't have money to buy new supplies, especially the last few weeks of school. So I had these little tiny nubs of pastels. So I started doing these great big drawings with scribbly pastel lines. And suddenly I was so great, my work was on the wall with every other student wow. in the class. Wow. So I thought, this was a real awakening. This was fun. I kind of found myself in a way. But again, you graduate, you go on, you know, you get married, you have kids, you work in my field, sociology, and I love that. And then one day I just decided, you know what, let's get back and kind of look at that dream again. Mm -hmm. So I quite literally said, pulled it out of the air, and I said, I think I'll be an artist. So I gave myself kind of a five-year plan, which is kind of how my left-sided brain works, and I had probably written it down, I don't remember. But if I could make some money by the end of that five years, then I could go ahead and keep pursuing art. And miracle of miracles, I actually made money. Now, it's not that I didn't work really, really, really hard, and I did have the opportunity to take a couple of art workshops in Louisiana, and I was like I found the other part of my soul. And I've always said that with art is kind of an artist's soul coming out and being put on whatever surface they're working on or sculpting and, and all of that type of thing. And it was just so wonderful to find that part of myself. And um, I had success. I was selling my paintings. They were getting into juried exhibitions and gallery shows, and I was doing street fairs, and people were actually buying my art, which I get so excited. I remember the very first thing I sold, I called everybody I knew, a little tiny thing. I called everybody I knew. I sold a painting. <laughs> yeah, I was so very, very excited. But. Um, you know, as time goes on, you just kind of find that dream. You keep working through life. You raise your children. You have that full-time job if that's what you need to do, but the art is always there. And I think when you have a great passion or dream about something, you find the time to make it work. All the time I hear people say, well, I just don't have time for that. Mm. And my response will be, you know, if you really, really want to do that, you'll find the time. And my time with the art was, you know, uh, three children, they come home from school, you feed them, you have those times together, lots of conversation, uh, they get their homework done, you do the bedtime routine, and then they're in bed, well, okay, it's 10 o'clock, I can do whatever I want to do. So my way of taking care of that dream was to go down to my basement, which at that time was a very cold, cold basement in the wintertime, I'd have a blanket wrapped around myself, or kind of hot in the summertime, but you paint. You paint and paint and paint. And you don't always have a success, but I'm a firm believer if you start a painting, and with the watercolors, I always work 22 by 30, so they were large. I would always finish a painting. No matter how awful it was, I would keep going through it till I could get it as good as possible. Mm. And then once I had done that, I would do that same painting again, and sometimes a third time. Because I wanted to make sure that I truly understood the concept that got me to that point. Right. That it would become a somewhat seamless situation so that the, the art would just emerge. And um, I think because the art needs to be a part of your soul and there's a passion about doing it, I want the viewer to see that on paper or canvas. So, you know, when COVID hit, like everything else, in life, things stopped. Mm, the whole we world had to make a lot of different decisions, a lot of different choices. So I ordered an obscene amount of acrylic paints <laughs> and other things online. So they arrive at my door, and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I'm committed. 
in more this than one way it. yeah right. but i got to do this so now i have a gorgeous studio that my son-in-law the architect designed for me and um I spent a lot of time in that studio honing that skill set. And I remember the very first painting I did, and I do like to work really large. I just spent hours doing this. And I have the music on loud, even though I can't sing. I love to hear the music. <laughs> so I have it on really, really loud. What and kind I, of music? What do you oh, use? Anything. You name yeah. it, I love it. Yeah. You know, the, the yeah. music that my kids love, yeah. oldies. My mom loved big band stuff. Sure. I'll listen yeah. to that. You know, just whatever. But I do find that if Queen's on, I paint a lot faster yeah. than Tony Bennett's on. You, right. know, so. you will, right, exactly. Yeah, so it makes a difference. But that very first painting, I got it all finished, and I stood back to look at it, and I'm like, oh, this is awful. So what I did, I literally stood over the trash can with the palette knives. You've got a ton of paint on there. I scraped it off, and I was saying $5, $10, $15, $20 with paint going down the, in the trash can, and that's okay. Cleaned off the canvas, started again. So it's that same process. And like anything, once you love doing something, you don't mind spending the time and doing over and over and over. So a very long answer to your no, question. No, but it's a great progression <laughs> of inspiration. What, uh, in terms of how you are inspired to do the actual work, I know from memory is one of those things, mm -hmm. but do you also paint from photographs. Tell us a little bit about the process. You know, I seldom paint from a photograph unless someone wants me to do a specific spot that's important to them. I think that um, even though I take tons of photographs if I go somewhere and I might think to myself, oh, I love to have those trees look. Let me glance at that photograph. I really don't do anything with them. I truly paint from my memory and my creative eye so that when I start a composition, I've got my canvas and I have these chalk markers, and I may put five, six lines on there. Mm. And that's all I do for my composition. And then I start with a brush. I like to get that first basic um, layer of paint in there so that I can see that composition and edit as needed. So this is still pretty much of a left-sided, in some ways, approach. And then when I pull out the palette knives, anything goes. You just, you play. You play with layers, you play with textures, you play with color and values, all those things that really make a painting unique. And because you're being playful in that process, I think that's when the passion comes out. That's when you expose your soul to the viewer of that piece of art. And when that person takes that art home to be part of their life, I always feel like, well, this is my child. They've gone to a good place out there, they've found their own life, and they're doing great. So there's a lot to be said about that. But it's just a really interesting process, and I think you have to have a balance between somewhat left-sided, but you have to have that right side, and you have to be comfortable with the ability to let that just come out so that people can see that and share that. And some people are not kind critics. Some people love your work, but you have to say one's as good as the other. You have to know both. How do you describe, I know texture is such an important part of the work that you do, how do you actually define and describe the actual style of painting you're doing? I think the longer I've painted, the more impressionistic they've become. And um, I love that layering where things just happen. And um, on a big canvas, it's in some ways easier, in a lot of ways it's easier, but because you can have things just sort of dry a little bit with the acrylic paints. Mm. And kind of my favorite part of the painting sometimes is when that paint is to that sticky citrus kind of um, stage where you have a little bit of a skin on it so it's not going to move. And you just lightly take that palette knife and pull it across that canvas and things just hit and miss. And it's that willingness to allow that to just happen. And sometimes you go back in and you edit it a little bit, but a lot of times that first piece of the palette not going across is perfect. And I think it's important for me anyway to paint for hours on a piece and then keep it into that passion, sharing, a little bit of editing as you go, but then stand back. And if you stand back and look at it too often, then you get too critical of it. But if you've put yourself out there on that canvas, then suddenly you have this amazing painting that's yours. 
Are there other painters that you know you've been inspired by that have inspired you along the way? I mean, did you used to watch Bob Ross? <laughs> no, but it's funny. My grandkids said, "Oh, Grandma, you got to see this great new painter on TV. He's yeah. on YouTube or whatever he's on." And sure, right. I said, "Oh, who is it?" Yeah. And they told me. It's like oh, I love it—the longevity, the the relevance for all that period of time. That's so wonderful. But no, I, I really didn't do anything of that. We do have um, the amazing Nelson Gallery of Art in Kansas City, which is just a wonderful, wonderful place. And we have a very large um, Impressionist um, collection. And we borrow and lend great paintings to other galleries around the country. Um, and so I think my favorite has always been Monet. Mm. And it's probably because of the water lily painting. Mm. It's on an enormous wall, pretty much by itself. And I've gone and I've sat on that bench and just, just immersed myself into that painting. And of course, Monet has such a variety, even within his impressionistic feel, there's a variety in what he's doing. And early on, um, it, it seemed from what I've read that he really did say, I'm going to paint this and paint it again and see how the light changes and how you, know, you do different things about with that. And of course, his in, um, interpretation of Impressionism is probably different than mine. What is yours? Mine is more that in the moment that, again, you're so involved into that painting. And since it's coming out of my head, it's my impression of that visual and how it's going to react to the other things within that framework around it. And does that change as you're painting? I think it can. I think it very definitely can. Um, I've always said that a painting, um, even back when I was doing my watercolor, starts out as a beautiful brand new baby. Yeah. And that baby is so precious and so perfect and you just adore that child more than anything. And But you're there, you're coddling it, you're taking care of it. And then suddenly that baby has the terrible twos. So, okay, a little bit of a problem, but I'm patient. I love this child. I'm going to keep working on it. And I do the same thing with the painting. And then suddenly two becomes three and four and all of those amazing, fun, fun ages with kids. And you're like, oh, I got this made. I'm on a roll now. And then I don't care what painting it is or probably what kid it is. They right. become a teenager. They become a teenager, right. And that teenage angst in that I'm going to do it my way, whatever, is, is there in the painting also. And um, I think that conversation with your kids, obviously, but also having that conversation with your painting, which sounds a little weird, but it's kind of what I believe in, because I'm listening to what the painting is trying to tell me, as well as to guide that painting to some degree. So we come to a meeting of the minds. You see the painting as alive. I do. Yeah. I, I know, yes. haven't thought of it that I'm way, but I guess that I do. Feeling yeah. right. Yeah. It's, it's it's a living, breathing entity. Right. And I want it to have the opportunity to be who it needs to be. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to be a hovering helicopter mom. I want to be the mom that says, "Okay, let's talk about that. Let's let's see how that works." And the luxury with the acrylic, if something doesn't work. I can go back in and change it very easily. I mean, I'm so do you see it as, a, as an extension of yourself, but also as a separate entity that may be even guiding you at the same time? I do. It probably sounds a little out there. No, it makes total sense. But I think I really do. Because you give it the power to mm -hmm. let it yeah. do its thing. Yeah, because you know, when it's a brand new baby, a brand new canvas, I might have some kind of a visual in my head but the reality is that may not be where we end up. And right. so A to Z could do all kinds of fun things in between there. And I think a good artist, according to my interpretation, is that you have to know what's there, but you also have to let that kind of guide you. Exactly. And sometimes I'll accidentally mix a color, and I talk to myself, too, on top of all that. And I'll go, wow, that's a great color. I love that. Right. And I talk a lot about what I like towards the end of the painting is the palette gunk. I have ah, a big glass right. surface I am mixing paints on. And sometimes just by kind of remixing and coming up with what's there, it's like, wow, that is a gorgeous color. And I know color fairly well, so I can usually tell you how to mix most colors. But somebody will say, oh, I love that. How did you get that color? My answer is palette gunk. 
you know, so it's <laughs> That's easy. What it is. It's just, you know, it is what it is. Tell us about the process, because the process itself is unique in the way that you do it, even with the use of tools. Well, and I love using the palette knives, and um, because you, it's a texture you put down, but sometimes it's an unknown texture, and you really do go with happenings. And the reason I put that base down with a brush to get my composition is also because when you pull a palette knife across the canvas, it kind of does this hop, skip, and jump where it's not necessarily going to cover everything. So it's important that you have something underneath there. And then you just start putting in layers. And uh, depending on um, where you are within the painting, you do certain kinds of things to get um, areas of the landscape to push back, certain things to bring the, those areas forward. And so those things are always working in my head, and at the same time I'm doing that balance of letting the painting kind of guide me as to what it needs. And so the texture's very different when the paint is all wet, mm -hmm. and then I talked about when it gets kind of sticky, and then something different happens when it's dry. And you almost hear music when it's dry because you're pulling your palette knife across that canvas mm -hmm. and you're hearing that scraping kind of fun sound. And depending on how thick the texture is or how big the, the texture is, will be a different sound. But that gives you different kinds of effects. How about use of color? Uh, do you yourself personally lean towards the bolder, brighter, more vibrant colors? Or do you like muted colors or a blending of each? I probably like a blending of each, but I will say um, red has never been one of my favorite colors. However, with the acrylic paints that I use, you can mix such glorious shades of red. It is unbelievable. So I've become kind of a, a liker of red because of that. And um, I like my colors to be bold. I like them to have a subtlety to them, a sophistication. And I will seldom, very seldom, use a pigment directly out of the jar or the tube. I'm a big, big believer in mix those colors, mm. come up with some nuances that aren't automatically there. And by doing so, I think you get some additional layers and a lot of vibrancy. And even if it's a subtle group of colors, it can still have vibrancy. Very similar to a chef when they're in the kitchen with different ingredients mm -hmm. and maybe those ingredients were initially destined to make a certain kind of meal, but then they take the things out of the cupboard and the refrigerator and they sort of put some things together and see where it takes them mm -hmm. as they're sampling and mm -hmm. maybe salting it a little more and all of a sudden they get with these ingredients they've used for other dishes a whole new thing they've created mm -hmm. by allowing it to happen and experimenting. It sounds very similar to when a recipe or just not even a recipe when you're just in the kitchen doing your thing mm -hmm. as a chef. I think that's a great analogy, absolutely. It's, it's still a creative pursuit, you know, and creativity many times is pulling in just a little bit of this or a little of that. And I often wonder if a great chef, he's, does he know exactly proportions he used? It's like somebody's grandma has this great family recipe. Well, who knows, even if you try she to replicate it. She never measured, it, yeah, she, just she just did. Pinch yeah. and whatever yeah. the pinch is, is and her And they were pinch. great, yeah, yeah, they were great. You know, um, how about as far as when you're working on the painting? Like, for example, I do, uh, I've always done it, even as a kid, landscaping. Mm -hmm. uh, I just have a green thumb. Mm -hmm. People even ask me, can you do my yard? Yeah, do my yeah. So I, when we're doing like a landscaping and garden type of work, mm -hmm. and we're planting flowers, perennials, annuals, and different right. things, I don't see it as just, okay, we're dumping things into the ground just to add color and just to fill in that spot. Mm -hmm. But it is like a painting. Certain shades, certain types of plants, mm -hmm. height, shadowing, color, sun, full sun, shadow, whatever, shade, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, is all part of the mix. And there are times when I've planted a whole thing, mm -hmm. a whole beautiful garden area, and then I'm watching it. I'm, I'm watching what's growing, what needs help what's not responding and what's taking off. Mm -hmm. And I will probably two or three times during a season dig up plants mm -hmm. and move them around. Like, you know, that is clashing with that. Mm -hmm. That really is not playing off that. Or that one is dominating what's mm -hmm. going on that mm -hmm. needs to be in the forefront. Right. So where a lot of people will just take them and put them in the ground, water them twice a week and they'll be done with it. 
I'm looking at it constantly to see mm -hmm. what is the best way for it to really showcase itself. And that sometimes requires digging things up mm -hmm. and moving them around. Are you that way when it comes to your painting? Mm -hmm. Are you working on things and then you're like, hmm, maybe not. Let me move this around. Mm -hmm. Let me see what is better this way. Very much so. And I think it is that balance. And just because a color doesn't work here doesn't mean it won't work back there. Right. And so you try to get this little bit of a verbal memory of um, how you got that color. Or don't forget to use that periwinkle blue or whatever it right. is. Right. And uh, gardening is composition just like a painting. That's what it's all about. And I think a great example is a hosta gardener. I have a very good friend who is a hosta gardener. Um, her husband and she, they have this amazing garden of hostas and the different shades of green. Because greens can be hard. Yes. The shades, the texture, the placement, the size, all of those things go into that. So always, anytime you're working with a little more monochromatic palette, which you may be in a garden, you might want an all-white garden or something that's got all the brights in it, you still have to get that balance in there. So I think a lot of things in life are, you know, wardrobe is the same basic thing. There are so many ways that people take care of composition and color that they're not even aware of. It's just something they do. So do you, does what you do as a painter, does this transfer to other aspects of your life? Like, mm -hmm. do you see things visually that way 24-7? When you're looking at a garden, or you're out in nature, when you're at the ocean, mm -hmm. when you're picking your clothing, mm -hmm. is it like an art to you? I think it probably is, and I garden also. And I'm very much, my garden would be described as an arty English garden. It doesn't follow the guidelines of the traditional English garden, which I love, but um, it has its that parts of myself in there. And I think a lot of gardeners, a part of themselves, are in that garden. I know my grandpa was my, kind of my inspiration to be a gardener. He mm -hmm. could grow anything, and he, yeah. had, he just had a green thumb. Yeah. It's just the way it that was. Just, and yeah. I learned a lot just you know, toddling around as a little tiny person, and I learned from him. So that was great. So I think that creativity is in most people. They're just not willing to say, yeah, I got some. When you start a painting, do you have a uh, time limit? Do you put a time limit that is self, you know, created or mm -hmm. you just let it roll you don't say okay i'm going to do this and i want this done by uh, you know a week and a half from now or 48 hours from now or a month from now how do you do it when you do it you just let it ride there's no rushing there's no deadlines mm -hmm. other than the paintings are brought with me today um basically i kind of let it just go as it needs to go um, bigger paintings you would think would take, you know, how many times bigger it is is times the time that it would take. But that's not necessarily the case because you can, I find more freedom in painting big. So it happens a little quicker sometimes. But I think that painting will know when it's an adult. That painting will just kind of know when you're finished. And I think one of the hardest things for an artist to do is know when a painting is finished. And so for myself, if I put a couple of things on there and I take them both off, that painting's probably done. Yeah. So I need to say, okay, enough. Walk away. When do you know it's done? When do you get that feeling? It's, I, I ask authors sometimes mm -hmm. when they write a book, maybe it's a memoir or whatever it is, when do you know to put the last period on the last sentence? Mm -hmm. You may do a few rewrites, but when are you comfortable to walk away from the book and then let the public experience the book? How do you know? What's the sensation you get when you know the painting is done? I think when you really stand back and look at it, it's like, okay, this works. I mean, the balance is there. And I do kind of go through a checklist. If there's something wrong with the painting, it's usually value contrast. So I, I'll ask myself, okay, are the values correct? Are the color ranges, the intensity levels? Are all of those things where they need to be for this painting to work? And it's not that I run through that list, but my subconscious does. And you just kind of know, you know, it, it's funny. And sometimes you'll walk away from it knowing it's not quite right, and I'll say, oh, i got a couple hours to go. Next day, 10 minutes, and it's finished. So yeah, you just, right? you know, sometimes you just need to walk away for a few just minutes. Just walk away, take a breath. Yeah. It's like writing music or just Absolutely. whatever it is. You have to take a breath, detach from the emotion of it, and then come back maybe even with a different perspective, right? Mm -hmm. Very much so. It's enhanced, perhaps. Yeah. So are, is it done when you're 
pleased with it or do you bring in the family and friends and say take a look what do you think no it's finished when I say it's when finished when you say right and if someone really I mean I have a friend who doesn't like the bright colored acrylics but she likes the ones that are soft you know what I think that's great she there's some that she loves some that she doesn't and I think that ability for people to have their preferences is what we're all about. Those exactly. are the things we celebrate. We all right. like things different. What is it about the textural aspect of it and the use of acrylics that really speaks to you? I think it's the versatility of acrylics and I do use um, acrylic gels and a modeling paste for my, my big aspen or, or birch trees and um, I think that they're, they're just fun because you can kind of experiment a little bit. You can really play. And I think that's probably the, the definitive um, explanation is you get to play. And you can play and play and you still can have things happen pretty much like you yeah. want them to. You specialize in landscapes, but you've also dabbled in other florals and animals mm -hmm. and things of that nature. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, I love doing animals in particular. Um, when I was doing my watercolors, they were animals and birds and um, flowers and all that. I never did a landscape honestly until I started doing these which is kind of funny. So when I started doing landscapes I started looking at the world out there a little bit differently. And uh, the reason I stick to landscapes is because when I was doing my watercolors I was told that I needed to come up with a body of work and there needed to be some consistency within that body of work. So I've kind of stayed with the landscapes even though I'll do some of the others periodically because I love them. But the landscapes, there is a consistency there. And I want to be at the point where people can say, oh, that's a Gail Faulkner painting. And that's why I'm willing to play and willing to change and grow and always keep an open mind about possibilities. I very much believe in the art world for myself is be outside the box. Mm -hmm. Never be what's expected. Never be what the textbook says. You got to do this, this, and this. And even though I don't have a degree in art, many times I think I'm kind of lucky because I have made up my own rules. More freedom. A lot more freedom. You know, I, I know what a lot of those are, but I'm not tied to them in the sense that I need to do just that because I do right. it because I want to. Because you want to. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you take a look at the, the beautiful work you do, I would imagine you don't have a favorite because they're like your children, like exactly. you said earlier. But are there certain seasons of the year that appeal to you? Like, do you love winter scenes, spring, mm -hmm. summer, fall? I think I love them all. I really do. Um, you know, living in the Midwest, of course, we have all seasons. Sometimes we have spring and then winter and back to summer. You yeah. know, we jump around a lot, so we see that. But I think, you know, the earth has so many beautiful things happening all the time. I want to embrace that. And how great to have crocus coming up in the snow. You know, those kinds of little things that are, kind of give us that feeling of life continues, that there is that continuity there. I think I really do kind of like fall because I use all those reds that I've yeah. suddenly fallen in love with. And um, but no, I, I like them all. I really do. How about as far as like going into a forest or a garden setting or an ocean, mm -hmm. any of those uh, stand out for you? You know, I love gardening, obviously. I mean, once you start being a gardener, it's with you for life, I think. And um, the woods are fun because there's so many things happening in the woods. If you really stop and listen and smell and just embrace that air that's there, um, that's always going to pull you in. The ocean I love, especially, again, being from the Midwest. We don't have the ocean very close, so it's a great treat to go there. And when I finish a painting, the thing I want to accomplish is that I want every individual to feel like they can literally walk into that painting, lean against a tree, hear the, the bees, see the butterflies, feel the wind on their face, all those kinds of things so that they immerse themselves within that world. And a lot of times when I'm describing our painting, I'll say, well, just, you know, go in there and lean against that tree and just breathe. Mm. Because I think we all need a place that we can do that. It's kind of a stressful world out here now. So it's good to have a place when you get home at the end of the day or, or whenever that you can just figuratively walk into that painting and breathe. And kind of find your oasis, your, your happy point. And I think that's good. When you walk into your studio and you have everything around you, mm -hmm. 
all the tools to make it happen, finished paintings, paintings in progress. Are you at peace? Is that your I, sweet spot? It kind of is. You know, it's a different life than I have in the rest of the house. The rest of the house is put together. It's very neat and tidy and beautifully decorated. Uh, the studio is um, a work in progress always because there's always more than one thing going on. And even though I have it, it organized, because mm. that's just the way my brain works, I bought a hanging system for the wall. Yeah. I have the slots where yeah. you put artwork in as they're being saved for this show or that show. And still, there's something about it. And kind of the key to that sometimes, if I turn on the music in particular, then I'm not working on the computer. I'm painting, I'm doing, I'm, I'm you know, really immersing myself into that creative world. And I think that's good to have that kind of a space. Mm, that's fantastic. Do you need, you have the music, but do you need peace and quiet around you? Do you, you know, sometimes when people go in to do writing or whatever, they say, mm -hmm. okay, everybody, keep it down. I got to go in and focus and think now. Don't, you know, turn the TV down. <laughs> How is it for you? You know, it's not that way at all. Um, I raised kids while I was painting. I've taught classes forever. I've done demonstrations before large groups, and if they want to ask a question, I can paint and talk. Sometimes I don't know what the painting is going to look like when I get done, but that's okay. Um, I'm very comfortable with that because I think that's part of the energy that might go into a painting. So I, I embrace all that. I really do. As much as you are an, an extraordinary painter, teaching as well is mm -hmm. very important. Do you enjoy teaching, inspiring, and mentoring others who look at this and say, oh, I would love to express mm -hmm. myself this way? I do. I, I embrace teaching. I love it. I remember when I went to college, my grandpa said, are you going to be a teacher or a secretary? Like, well, aren't there more choices? Well, right. not so many back then, <laughs> maybe, it, but right. never thought I wanted to teach. But I love teaching, and I taught kids for many, many years. Right. And now I have classes of seniors whom I adore. We just have so much fun. I have four different classes that I teach. and. For many of them, they've never done anything creative before, but they come into class and they find a different part of themselves. Mm -hmm. And I truly embrace the differences of each and every one of them. Mm -hmm. And so I have people that are a little more um, almost grandma Layton, and people yeah. that are a little more um, you know, specific, some that are more impressionistic. One I'm thinking of in particular that has a very kind of modern, abstracted approach. So they mm. all come from different places and are doing different things, which is what I want them to do. I want them to find their creative perspective and put it on canvas. And one of the best things about the teaching in the classes is that at the end of class, we always put everybody's work up on the rail, that we have a whiteboard and there's a rail there, and we do critiques. And I love doing critiques because you can you know, we talk about what we can do to improve a painting. Right. But we also talk about what's great about a painting. Yeah. And every single painting that's on that rail has such merit and value. And value is what art is about many times. Yes. So I love the teaching. It's super fun. You uh, showcase the work in galleries mm -hmm. uh, throughout the country, which is really beautiful. You have one... A uh, recent one at the time of this filming in New York, which mm -hmm. is exciting too. Tell us about that whole other aspect of setting it all up. How do you know what to bring, what to display, what to mm -hmm. showcase? And do you enjoy that aspect of it as having your work in galleries? Well, and galleries are fun. Um, but the great thing about galleries, you pack to ship, which is my least favorite part about being an artist is yeah. packing. Um, but you get them all, you know, bubble wrapped and shipped and on their way, and then the gallery typically sets them all up for you. I have a couple of things locally where um, in the Kansas City metro area that I will be taking it, schlepping it in, hanging it up, labeling, all that kind of thing. So it goes from both extremes. And when I was doing street fairs, you know, the problem there is setting up the canopy, setting up the screens taking all the paintings in. And now with the acrylics, it's not such a big problem. With watercolors, weather was a huge issue. Oh, I mean, yeah. huge. But um, the acrylics, not quite so much. But um, it's part of that process. And you paint sometimes towards the show. Um, you know that certain areas of the country really love certain kinds of art. Or um, you have a, a customer in, let's just say, Des Moines, Iowa, that always buys this kind of a painting. Some have three or four of that kind of painting for her to choose from. You know, things like that. So there, it's a great 
fun thing to do. It's also extremely hard work. Yeah. You know, there's an art community out there, and you may see an artist only every year at the Dallas 500, but um, there's still someone that you know and you connect with. You help each other out. So that community is important. It's just really fun. And one of the biggest, if you want to call it a problem in our show, you've got a van. You've got it packed very specifically. Protect the art, put the canvas, you know, all the makings of that um, canopy there, put the screens here. Well, you're really excited because you've had a really great show. Now you have empty spaces. Well, empty spaces are difficult because now things are shifting around as opposed to being nice, tight packing. So, you know, it's kind of the flip side of some things sometimes. But it's all fun. It really is. You mentioned uh, being inspired by Monet. Mm -hmm. uh, what are some of the similar characteristics to your work and Monet's and some of the differences? I think um, the layers is very much consistent with what Monet's done. And of course he had cataracts and his vision declined over time and so the water lilies um, are much more almost abstracted in their impressionistic yeah. feel. Um, but he was all about when the light changes during the day. And I still deal with light, but I don't deal with changes within one painting necessarily. I'm thinking more about the compositional and artistic balance, whereas he was painting nature as he saw it. And there's some, obviously some interpretation and all that, right. he's a master. Right. Um, but from my own perspective, somehow just those balances are important to me. Even though I'm a very right-sided creative person now, that left-sided brain I was born with is a very much a part of who I am. For the viewers that are watching, they're hearing us say impressionistic, impressionism, Define that a uh, little bit more as far as what that is. To me, Impressionism is in the moment creativity where you are putting layers down, but you're seeing them as they are, whether in your mind's eye or if you're looking at nature itself, that you're putting down the values where they need to be there. So you've got that value contrast moving forward. You've got a little bit of whatever initial color peeking through. And then when you're finished, you know exactly what a tree looks like or what the flower looks like. But nature may not have that specific flower out there, but the shape is consistent with what you do see. But it's my impression or the artist's impression of how we see that. And how I see a daffodil today may not be the way I see a daffodil two weeks from now. I may have a real variable because I'm in a different painting mode when the time comes. It must be fascinating for you too when people are looking at the work and you had a certain impression, mm -hmm. a certain uh, vision initially, and then other people are looking at the same painting, like uh, what's the expression, no two people see mm -hmm. the same mm -hmm. painting or art the same way. Mm -hmm. A lot of it comes from perspective and just things that have occurred in their own lives, they mm -hmm. see things with a certain lens. Uh, do you find that fascinating when they can see a painting that you've done, you see it this way, and then they bring in these other nuances because they're mm -hmm. picking out other different things and it's just delivering something different for them. I think that's great. I mean, I truly love that. I love that it speaks to them, number one. And they'll say, I'm just like, wow, I, and I'll have this conversation. I didn't think of it that way, but that is really good. That makes a lot of sense. And it kind of gives you that conversational continuity throughout the looking at that painting. And I think it's fascinating. We all see things differently. That's what makes us wonderful. Why do you love doing this? What is it about it? What does it do for your heart and soul? I know it brings out a part of me I never really thought of as um, valid, relevant. Um, maybe a lot of us growing up in the world, you know, we have responsibilities. We have parents to take care of because they yeah. took such wonderful care of us and we would anyway, but we have, you know, elderly neighbors, we have children, we have, you know, generations of people and we feel that that's so much a part of who we are and what we need to be available for. So this is like an escape for me, even though it takes up most of my day, which is great. But it's kind of an escape, too, because that is my opportunity to put myself out there. And it's, it's in front of the world. And if somebody, and you know, we'll all have this. It's like, oh, that's the ugliest thing I've ever seen. Mm. Okay, I'm sorry you don't like it, but 
look at that over there, you're going to love that one. And, you know, have introduced something different to them, and that's okay. Not everybody has to love what you're doing because you've put yourself out there. You have to have a little bit of a degree of confidence um, in order to do that, because you know you're going to get some of both, hopefully a lot more of the positive. But I think that it's just really, really important to put it out there. Let people see who you are, because this is a definition of yeah. who I am, and right. I think most people have something that defines them. Let's take a look at some of the work. I know there's some magazines that have the, the work as well, and you've got some beautiful, our studio is adorned with some absolutely spectacular work. So Gail, you have a beautiful piece of art right there in your hands. Let's talk about this one here. Okay, this one is called Sunlit, and when I started this painting, what I knew that I wanted to do was something to showcase sunflowers. They are the state flower of Kansas, but they also are all across the United States and, yeah. and other places in the world. And so they're a great flower, and one of the reasons I love them is because they do follow the sun. That head will tilt depending if it's sunrise right. or sunset, yes. and I find that really fascinating. I knew I wanted to do something with a red sky, so when I did my composition for this painting, it was a line. That was my entire composition to start. I do try very hard not to get that line in the middle of the canvas. I say that to my students all the time, and I'm really good about doing that. So then I have to adjust. And the reason why you wouldn't want to is? You don't want to cut it in half. Okay. You want to have one, either the top or the bottom, win a little bit. Yeah. So when I did this painting, I put down a dark red at the top, it was with my brush, did a dark green down at the bottom, mm -hmm. and then I just started on the sky. And I love, love, love doing palette knife skies because you don't know what you're going to get. I mean, I knew I wanted a sun in there. So I probably, did, thinking back, I probably did a little half circle there. So I went in with my palette knife, and I start by mixing different shades of red with some additional colors, and I literally take the palette knife. If this is my canvas and this is my palette knife, I just go across mm. the canvas. And I have a really, really light touch because I want it to be a hit and miss. And when you look really close, you can see how layers lay on top of each other and they do hop, skip, and jump across there, which is just really fun. And then while it's still wet, I'll go in and maybe get a little bit of an orangier layer here. So again, I mix my palette knife, um, the paint with my palette knife, use a little palette gunk here and there, draw it across again. And then I do the same, pulling some yellows into it. And I kind of play, do I want a little bit of white in there because I know I'm going to put the sun in there. And then other than just at that point putting some white paint where the sun is, I'm finished with the sky for the time being. I then go in and I'm going to do the, um, the sunflowers. Well, of course with distance, and we have a great sunflower field not far from where I live, so it was really fun to go there and make sure that what I was doing was what I was seeing. Was what you were saying, yeah. And of course at the distance you see that blanket of yellow, which is just so very, very gorgeous. And as you come forward, it gets to be a little bigger and bigger yes. and bigger. And at the same time you have to get that balance of green. So the greens towards the background here are a little bit lighter and a little bit cooler because that's how you create distance and they get warmer and a little bolder as they move down. So I'll get the yellows and the greens here, I'll pull another layer with a palette knife across here much like I did the sky mm -hmm. and then I'll go in and I'll start working on the sunflowers. So I usually do the big ones first, so I'll put my centers in, I'll put my petals in, I'll go back and highlight. And as I do these, I always have one that's central, that as far as focal point. And as I move back, they get smaller and smaller. And even back in here, there'll be a little dots of the brownish tone that was in the center of the sunflowers Very on nice. through there. Yeah. And then I go in and I start playing in the green. There's all kinds of things you can do with the side of your palette knife, with the tip just so, with, I mean, you name it, you can do it with these. And then I'm going to go back and I'm going to work on my sun. I have come up with kind of a great secret for sun. It's not a secret, but um, it's a balance of white and yellow is how you get that glow. Yeah. And I always want it to look like it's truly glowing, that you can't look at it totally because of that glow that's in there. Do you see this as setting or sun rising? I see it as whatever the viewer says it is. <laughs> I'm not going to argue with them. Good answer. You know, it's like, yeah. okay, that's, that's beautiful. It. I remember one time years ago I sold a painting and a um, buyer said, oh, I love that whatever flower it was. Well, that's not what I painted. 
but I pretended like it was because right. she loved it. Because she that's was taking what... it home. I wanted her to always have that in her head. But then you just start working with your highlights, and this is when I work with my value ranges. Do I need a little more dark up here or down here? And have those value ranges mm -hmm. and those intensity mm -hmm. levels like they need to be. So this is a painting which has a, just a very long, almost uninterrupted vista. And so you can do lots of fun things with the sky and then just kind of play with that. What I like too about these particular kinds of paintings is they also continue around mm -hmm. the sides, top and bottom of the actual right. Well, I think itself. any yeah. artist on canvas loves the fact that it's, these right. gallery wrap canvases are very good. Right. Galleries like them that way. They can yeah. hang in your home just no exactly like needed no framing needed. No framing needed. Right. And framing can overwhelm a painting. Yes. You know? Take and away so from it. I love this aspect. So when you walk in the room, you're seeing the side, but you're also seeing this great texture from the side. And you pull your hand across here, I mean, you could hurt yourself because yeah, there's a lot yeah, of texture yeah, coming yeah. out here. It's got a 3D effect, too, and it does. which we talk about. And yeah. it does. And that's not only the texture, it's how you do your value contrasts. It's how you highlight. There's so many little nuances that you do that, um, you know, over time it just becomes automatic. You don't really, really nice. think about it. But yeah, I love this. Does this have a name to it? Sunlit. This is sunlit. Yeah, this is sunlit. Very nice. And I always have to look at the names on the paintings because I don't remember. Because do so many. <laughs> I've done hundreds and I'm trying to always get a different name. Uh, it's hard. Yeah. It's really hard. So, But yes, Very I love this nice. painting. I love the colors Very and nice. the way it turned out. Perfect. And now you have another mm -hmm. work of art in your hands, Gail. This one is called Meadow. And this one has a little bit of that long distance perspective that Sunlit did. But it also has a lot of other things that kind of give it a little bit more of an, an intimate feeling yes, to it. Yes, there is. So with this one, I have a little bit of palette knife sky, but kind of knowing what I wanted to do back here in the background, I didn't want to get real thick textures. And that's hard for me. Mm -hmm. I had to not play so much. I had to think, okay, Gail, don't forget. <laughs> so I did my sky, and skies are always darker to lighter where the horizon line is. And I went ahead then, and I would just do my greens down here. But then I take my palette knife, and again, there's many ways you can hold the palette knife. With this one, I use big palette knives, and um, I hold it this way. And so I just have this kind of hop, skip, and jump style that I pull these yeah. colors down. Beautiful. So I would have started with probably this, this um, yellow ochre in through here and pull it on down. And then I would have gone in and get darker because you want some dark things along this horizon line so you feel like you can walk into it. Knowing I'm going to have greens down here, I pulled some pine trees and different kinds of foliage in there. And then I went back and I added some of these lighter tones just at the top part. So I really get that feeling of a great deal of depth. And then I would have left that for the time being, and I would have come down here, and this is just a very quick horizontal movement with some greens, and I've got some golds and pinks and different colors in there because I knew I was going to do this. Although if I decide at the last minute to add something that's bright red here, I can always go back and add bright red other places. So that's never an issue. Then I went in and I decided to do my birch or aspen trees. And these are done with modeling paste. And you put the modeling paste down there. And I kind of have developed a way of doing those that I really love, really wet into wet. And I get lots of highlights and shadows on there. So I'll go in and I'll get my darks in and get my lights in and my blacks on there. And then I'll come back to those later to refine. Then I go down here and I just decide, okay, let's do flowers this color. So I picked out this color, just did these little round flowers. Whatever kind you want to think they are, they are. And then I added a little bit of that color back in here for continuity. And at that point I went in and I worked on my greens some because I love to have this linear and have these little hop, skip and jump greens going for the impression of leaves. And then to one of my absolute favorite things, like I said before, is that purple on the palette knife. This is tacky, it's sticky, and I just literally draw that palette knife across there, mm. and what you get, you get. Yes. And 99% of the time, it's exactly what you want. If for some reason I get something I don't want, let's put something over it. It's not a big deal. And at that point, I'm ready to go back in. I'm ready to just kind of edit if I need to for my value contrast. I went back in probably on this one and did a little more depth in through here. And that's part of my um, thought. I want people to walk into this painting, smell these gorgeous flowers, have them hit against your leg as you walk through. 
If you want to lean on this tree, you can. And you're looking back here and you're thinking, okay, what's behind this little forested area? I want to walk back there and discover it. So it's not only a passionate type of journey for myself as the artist, it becomes a passionate journey for the viewer so that they really will enjoy that piece of art. It really draws you in, too. You know what I mean? It draws you in and it, you can get lost mm -hmm. in a painting like that. You, you know? really can't. Yeah. And I always said with shows, when you know, people walk past your, your screen at a show, it's one thing to have them stop and go, oh my gosh, I love that painting. But does that painting invite them in? If it invites them in, then you've got a good painting. If they just go, wow, I love that, and keep walking, then it doesn't speak to them in the same way. Do you ever have people where the painting invites them in? Mm -hmm. And they don't want to leave. Oh yeah. Well, yeah. Then the painting goes uh, with them. They want to live easy. there, right? Take Can it with you. Can we go in there? Can we, like... Yeah, that's part of the whole plan. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, it's great, and I, I always feel good when my child yeah. has found someone that loves it as much as I do. Are they duplicated? No. 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 You know, you'll see. Have you had some? Like, if this was everybody loved this and mm -hmm. everybody wanted one of these. Are you able to duplicate them, or these are just happening as they're no, happening? I mean, I can, okay, let's, let's say it this way. I believe that every person who buys a piece of my art is entitled to an original piece of art, because mm -hmm. that's what I've said it is. If I have someone who wants something similar to it, I'll do something similar. But I'm not going to repeat exactly so what that is. So it's not one of no, 300 No, that's a, that's a print. You know, that's, that's when you do a print. Yeah. yeah. And as an artist, I think it would be incredibly difficult to get that kind of passion into every piece every if you were just repeating one. the right. same one. Right. That's, you know, that's something we did as kids. Or we, yeah. They become what was diluted. Number? Yeah. Each one is diluted thereafter. Exactly. And yeah. so then my buyer of the first ones would go, well, mine's not worth that much because there's 23 because of them out there. Because there's others out there. Yeah. And I, I just don't think from, from my personal self is that I want to duplicate. I'm more than happy to do what they want. What if, say, for example, you paint something like this. Oh, all of these are exquisite. You paint something like this, and you love it. <laughs> but you also would love for other people to enjoy it. Do you do another one for yourself? No, because that would be a duplication that again. That is the duplication. Yeah. Yeah. You know, once in a while, it'll live in my house, you know. Yeah for a while right and I know when I was selling my watercolors you know it's like the poor you know cobbler's kids that didn't have shoes I didn't have a lot of art on my walls yeah <laughs> I remember someone was coming I was in a, a big fair in Kansas City and um, a gentleman called me and said I saw your painting at the show I want to buy it for my daughter mm. so he came to the house to buy that painting and in the process he saw one I had hanging in my living room it was like I think I want that one too. I think I want that you know, one too. Okay. Yeah. That child yeah. goes out the door, you know. Yeah. And because and I do hang things outside in the garden. You yeah. know. Yeah. And people yeah. are like, Oh, you'd put that. Well yeah, I'm just paint another one, you know. Just paint another but, one. But um, it's it's something about enjoying art. It has to be in the right place. Right. So nice. Beautiful. Gail, you have a, yet again another beautiful piece of art in your hands. Tell us about this one. This one I called Ruby because it is a lot of those reds that I have learned to love so much. And on this one, I wanted to create a little more of a secluded, intimate area. Mm -hmm. So I have everything a little bit closer in, and I've done that with you know the way that background is painted and the size and the location of the trees. Knowing that I wanted to do color down here for these beautiful flowers, and that I needed to repeat that color up top, I kept my sky really simple. And uh, so that was quick with the brush. The sky is there. Much like the last one, I started the process here. But again, because I was going to do so much in through here, I didn't want to get this as complicated as in the last painting. So but basically the same process where I put the side of my palette knife, I put the mid-tone down, go back in with the highlight, and then the values on down at the bottom. And I find that I do many times during the process of creating a piece is I go back and I reinforce these values because something tells me they need to be a little bit different. So then I've already got the green down here. I start much the process and I've learned the hard way. It's much easier to do these areas before the trees than to try to use a palette knife around those trees. Some of those shapes get pretty small in there. But I'll get the initial part done there with many, many layers. Go ahead and do a secondary layer. Um, on the bottom with the green, so I've got two or three shades of greens. 
And when I say do a layer, it's not that there's one layer. There may be 10 layers here. Mm. There may be mm -hmm. 15 layers here, yeah. may seven there. You know, there's a lot of layers because I adjust as I go. So as you're creating each layer, do you have to wait for one layer to dry fully before the next layer can go on it so they don't merge? No, and that's the great thing about palette knives. Because you barely touch the canvas, um, even if you're painting totally wet into wet, there's something about laying that paint across there where it just kind of hop, skips, and jumps. And I may know what I kind of want this to look like, but kind of want know is where it actually is because I have no idea what's going to happen exactly. And if I had, you know, I might have needed another red spot. I might have had too many and took some out, you know, and that's where I do the adjustments. But wet into wet is fun. It's great fun. And then these trees, these are some of my favorite trees up close like this because yeah. you can really get that modeling paste on thick. And if you look at this from the side, they do come out some. The birch, yeah. yeah. So I have got that modeling paste on there. I get my darks and my lights. On these, I did all of that while the modeling paste was wet and more of a time consideration. Sometimes I'll do this next step after it's dry. But this is so small, I probably did it now. And I would just go back in and reinforce the white get my darks in there, maybe reinforce this, maybe not. Just make that decision as to what needs to be done to the painting. This has probably got four or five layers with the red, and it was basically the same process, except instead of going across, I went up. And that gave me another value change because I did the darks here, midtones, and lights. And sometimes you don't see those from a distance, but that's what gives the flowers depth. You got to have those value contrasts in order for it to work at all. So um, this one I love, and I do have a big painting that is somewhat similar to it. That's going to be in the Amsterdam Whitney show, but this is completely different, also. So you know, there's just so many ways you can plant a tree. Exactly. We are uh, looking at different sizes of paintings here. These are a little bit more maneuverable, mm -hmm. a little bit smaller. How large do yours get? Well, I love to do the ones that are 48 by 48. I have done several that are, um, gosh, what are the sizes of my 36 by 48 or 36 by 4? I mean, I really love working big yeah. because it gives you the opportunity to play more. Um, you get more happenings in there. And um, the compositionally, you have to have more possible items in there, you know, but big, I can do a mountain in there. Mm. I could do this painting with a big old mountain in the back. I could yeah. really play with additional layers backwards and more things coming frontwards. So larger paintings, I think, are more fun. They can be more of a challenge. But I think painting small is almost more of a challenge than painting large. Have you ever been asked to paint, like, uh, sort of muralesque type things, uh, you know, walls, mm -hmm. uh, buildings, or just really You know, large I actually things? did murals for a while. Um, kind of, you know, I'd done the watercolors for 35 years or whatever it was. I just needed a little bit of a change. A friend asked me, um, the church that she was attending was going to do a very specific program within that church um, denomination um, to do some murals in her church. So I did. I thought, okay, I'm going to get a college education right here doing these murals. I learned a ton. That led to commercial murals. It led to lots of things in people's homes. And that's when I needed the studio. So I have, my studio is like 100 or 1,000 square feet. So it's mm, a big studio. Nice size. And I have a long wall that I would tack rolls of, cut rolls, cut canvas off of rolls, would tack them up on the wall, and I would paint them there on that wall. So I learned a ton. Kind of a funny story. When my studio was first built, people would, it's a big walk neighborhood. So people would be walking past all the time. They're like, what is she building over there, you know? And one evening, I didn't have any kind of blinds on my two great big sliders at the time, and I have this canvas all over the wall, and I'm painting, and I'm painting, and I'm painting, and for this grocery store, I pa painted more cows than I ever thought I would. <laughs> so I'm painting this cow, I've got the face just right, and I turn around, there was a group of about 10 plus people on the sidewalk across the street, and they all go, yay! It was just so fun. They really you enjoyed know? it. Yeah, so That's the murals fantastic. were fun, and I think they were a good transition from the watercolors to these. Yeah. And my, I remember my daughter, one of, um, daughter Jill said one time that they were very painterly. 
and my mm. strokes. Mm. And I hadn't really thought about that. Yeah. But then later on as I started doing these acrylic paintings, I can see that they are painterly. Right. Which to me just means creatively placed. Right. Very nice. And again, the name to that one is? This one is called Ruby. I always have Ruby. to look because I don't remember. Very beautiful. Yeah, I like this one a lot. Gil, your work is absolutely spectacular. Thank and I'm you. so glad that we were able to actually see some of it up close and personal here at the TV studio. Uh, this obviously gives you great personal blessing and joy to do this work, doesn't it? It does. I, I embrace it. I love doing it. Um, I feel very fortunate that I have found this path. And um, I hope everybody can find their personal path. Now, the work is available for purchase, right? It and is. You go to the website uh -huh. and, and check it out. How does that work? Um, you know, I have a website, gailfaulknerfineart.com. Everyone's welcome to come on to the website, um, look around, see if there's something that speaks to you. Um, you can purchase directly on the website. Um, you can also send me an email. I'll be glad to have a conversation with you through that email or if you want to talk personally. And then I do galleries. I have a gallery opening next week in um, New York like you spoke of earlier, which I'm very excited about. And so there's just lots of ways to find my work and any artist's work. It's a different world than it used to be, but that marketing aspect, it's there. How has it changed? Well, when I first decided to get you know, back into this full time, I retired from a, a, you know, a big job, um, marketing was tough. Yeah. You know, back before yeah. it was like you send postcards, you let people know you're coming. You hope they respond. Right, and... right. But now it's like getting published. Um, I There's a, something called cafe that artists all use around the country, around the world. And I applied to a call, thought, you know what, what have I got to lose? So sometimes it's just putting yourself out there. Right. You might fail. That's okay. Try again another time. But they accepted my work. It was published. and. I'm not even sure of how the path has happened, oh, but happened. it's been happening, so that's pretty cool. And you're in. We have some various magazines and things in front of us here on yeah. the, the coffee table, huh? It's uh, Yeah, I brought a couple of magazines. I took the top two off the pile. Right at first, I was like, sure, oh my yeah. gosh, I'm so excited. It's in here. Let me buy the magazine. Well, you only need so many magazines, obviously. Yeah, if you want to lean forward, you can grab yeah. one of them. We can show the viewers. Yeah, Here's an idea a, of how yeah, this it's is displayed in the magazine. Spotlight. Well. This is an organization out of France. And they selected this painting to be in their publication. Very nice. And this has great reflections on the water. I love water reflections. Um, it took me a little while to get them just right, but yeah. I wanted that same glow. So now I know how to do them. Very They're nice. They're just super fun to do, but a lot of the same techniques. That's this terrific. piece is 36 by 36. Hmm. And then well, I'm great. also included in um, this book. Yes, which I can't get a hold of yeah. here. There we go. Bring that over. And, uh... this, is, this book is called Current Masters 6. Um, it has three paintings that were selected for this publication. And it's fun to have them there on this page. Um, this goes around the world. So lots of great opportunities there. Yeah, for You visibility. never know where your positive marketing is going to come from. So That's you put it. yourself out there in lots of places. That's great. And again, if you don't try, you don't know. So I That's encourage it. everyone, find your dream and go for it. That's amazing. Again, congratulations Thank on, you. on all of this. This is really sensational, Gail. Um, has it exceeded your expectations, what um, you're doing and the feedback you get from people? How yes and no. It brings such joy into their life? I mean, the answer is truly yes and no. It exceeds my expectations in that I have created, if I can say that, um, something that is looked at by people around the world and they embrace it and they love it but it doesn't exceed my expectations because I am an extreme type A personality so there are no boundaries there are no expectations that I don't feel can be reached and so um, I'm willing to work very hard I'm willing to learn as an artist I'm willing to work outside the box and that's what's going to help make me successful Are you a perfectionist? No, I'm not I am probably close but I'm like a golfer. I'm harder on myself than anybody else. Than anybody else, yeah. right. But um, no, I would call myself a perfectionist. Being a gardener and a painter, you can't be. No, you have to go with right. what nature allows What's you to do and what the palette knife way. allows me to do. But I find great joy in the imperfection sometimes. I tell you, this was really fascinating. We've gone in so many different directions with the conversation mm -hmm. and with the visuals. Uh, 
really thoroughly enjoyed meeting you, Thank Gail. You. You're, you're uh, somebody who's very soulful, you're very passionate, very enthusiastic, and you're, you're showing us life through your own lens mm -hmm. with the impressionistic way that you're doing this. But then when we see these beautiful works of art, we sort of make them our own which I know is something that, like you said earlier, brings you great joy. It does. Um, continued success with everything. Thank and you. I hope we get a chance to uh, explore more down the line. This was truly, truly a pleasure. I hope you enjoyed it as well. It was great. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. <laughs> if you'd like to learn more about Gail Faulkner and her extraordinary work, visit her website, gailfaulknerfineart.com. For close-up television and radio, I'm Jim Masters. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you again next time.